chromosomes. 22 of them are what we refer to as autosomes. Now the autosomes, which are numbered 1 to 22, recombine in every generation like a red and a blue deck of cards. And so every time there's a shuffle, a child is produced. That's why children look similar to each other or may favor one parent or another parent, but they don't look identical because when you take those two decks of cards and you shuffle them, it's unlikely, unless you're a croupier, that you're going to shuffle them and have them red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. More likely it will be red, red, blue, 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 red, blue, blue for the first shuffle. And then if you shuffle them again, it's unlikely you'll shuffle them or reshuffle them in the same order. And again, that's why genetically children will look similar to or have some traits of the parents, but they won't look, of course, identical to a parent, and the children will not look identical unless they're twins. They won't look identical to each other. Down here at the lower right-hand side, we have the sex-determining chromosomes. That's the Y chromosome. If a man passes a Y in the sperm, the child will always be a boy. If a man passes an X, the child will always be a girl. And so uh, for that reason, uh, I'm now allowed to tell you that, that half the population, guys, doesn't have a Y chromosome. They seem to get along just fine without it. Um, most of you can just turn to your right and or left and see someone that does not have a Y chromosome. But I've been told by my friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Hammer from the University of Arizona, author of that Kohanim study, that there is some circumstantial evidence that the Y chromosome uh, provides the, uh, the male skill at the clicker gene <laughs> and, then, and, then the Sunday, and then the Sunday sports gene. And beyond that, there's no conveyance of benefit from having the white chromosome. Now, let us continue. So uh, we've highlighted that Y chromosome. We're not really going to talk about the X at this point. What we're going to, what we'll talk uh, later about the mitochondria. So there are three types of DNA tests. Three types. One, the Y chromosome test, which I've already described to you. And that Y chromosome test was the one that I needed to get my cousin in California to take to try to match me up with those folks in Argentina. Of course, his response was, I'm a sheriff here in Culver City. I know what we do with DNA, and I'm not giving you my DNA. Meanwhile, I was out working on a proof of concept. Uh, I was testing, uh, my goal was to test 24 Ashkenazi men to see if, you know, if you know, the twins matched, if the two men who said that they were Levites potentially matched. How about the two unrelated men who said they were Cohanes? I got a couple of second cousins who tested. I got a couple of people with the same last name not known to be related to each other. I got them to test. And all those results were coming back, or all the kits were coming back to me, and my cousin in California still had not agreed. And so I called him to do what anyone would do when they're desperate. I called to bribe him. And so I asked him, well, I intended to ask him what it was going to take for me to get him to, you know, give me a DNA test. Fortunately, he was out washing the car. His wife answered the phone. She said, I remember you. You sent us that nice 11 by 17 of our family genealogy earlier this summer. And, uh, and I said, well, I think I found relatives in Argentina, and I intend to use DNA to show if they're related. She said, what a great idea. And I said, if your husband only felt the same way. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, he's told me he won't do a DNA test. And she said, no, 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 he'll do the DNA test. Send the kid out. And I said, well, I said, Andrea, how can you be so sure? And she said to me, Bennett, I'm his wife. I can guarantee it. <laughs> and so, and so. I sent the kid out, it came back very, very quickly, and the 24 samples went to the University of Arizona for processing. That's the male inherited Y chromosome, from your grandfather to his son, to his son's son, to his son's son's son. It 
that's passed down and literally does not change from generation to generation. The mitochondria, which is the energy component of our cells, comes from a woman. It's, it's, um, it's present in her body at, uh, uh, at, at birth. The mitochondria is passed down to all of a woman's children. The daughters pass it on to the next generation. So I have my mother's mitochondria. My mother had two sons. Therefore, her mitochondria is not going to be passed down. Okay? There's no one, I mean, if we would have had a daughter, she would have passed it down. And so we use the mitochondria to look at our mother's, 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 mother's line. And we look at the Y chromosome to look at our father's, father's, father's line. And then we use that third type of DNA, the autosomal DNA, to look at uh, the DNA that we got from mom and from dad. And if you've seen any of the television commercials and you'd have to be living in a cave like, like Nasrallah in, uh, in, uh, in Lebanon to, to not have seen the advertisements from Ancestry.com and 23andMe that give you those percentage tests. Well, that autosomal test is what we also use for percentage testing. Let me go to the next slide here. So, uh, what we had talked about is the Y chromosome, the Y follows the male line, and you can see the blue on the left hand, on the left hand side here. Uh, and that's the transmission of the Y, the transmission of the mitochondria, oops, sorry about that, the transmission of the mitochondria is in red on the other side of the screen, but no one else, in other words, all the folks who are marked in gray, I cannot provide my DNA and directly interrogate them, at least I couldn't, uh, with the Y chromosome and with the mitochondria in 2000 when I started this business. Only in 2010, when autosomal testing started to become um, more te technically capable and more popular, could you find if you're related to the people in the center. Now, let's talk a little bit science for a moment. There are two kinds of DNA that we're going to talk about, there, well, that we can talk about in genetic genealogy or genetic anthropology. Number one, on the left-hand side, it says SNP. That stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. That's just a single base pair change, a copying error that takes place in the genome. You can use that to identify people that you are related to thousands of years ago. On the right hand side, uh, there's something that's called an STR that stands for a short tandem repeat. It's a genetic stutter and we use that to identify people who are related to us within a couple of hundred years. Uh, what you're looking at now is a tree of mankind. This is called a phylogeny. A phylogeny is a theoretical construct of how evolution has taken place for a species. So this is the Y chromosome phylogeny. You can see that it started in Africa um, about 100 to 200,000 years ago. And there's a branch called A, and A had another son who had, you know, who had some more children. We call them B. C, D, and E. In other words, those branches all come from that, that bifurcation point. And essentially, there is geographical specificity to these letters. So if you're from haplogroup A, you're male, you're from haplogroup A, you're probably from southeastern Africa. If you are D, D today is found in Japan, and it's found in the mountains of Tibet. Um, if you are F, you're from the Caucasus. If you are H, you're from India. Uh, I was the first group of men to come into Europe about 35, 40,000 years ago. Their ancestors probably did in the Neanderthals, either because they beat them or they outcompeted them for resources in a world that was getting colder and food was becoming in shorter supply. Uh, J is typically found in the Middle East, and I'm going to come back to this 
uh, in a few minutes, but this tree is really fundamental to understanding the, I would say, anthropology and the DNA of the Jewish people. So let's look at a historian's claims that I think are at odds with genetics. Has anyone here read the book, The 13th Tribe? Has anyone heard of the book, The 13th Tribe? Okay, there we go, thank you. So uh, there was this fellow named Arthur Kostler, and Kostler, uh, Kostler had a theory. Uh, he, he believed that Ashkenazi Jews, that European Jews, were not descended from the Judeans of antiquity, but they were converted in the 8th or 9th century uh, from a people called the Khazars, who had their kingdom between the Caspian Sea, the Black Sea, and all the way north to Kiev. Now, his claim, or his, his goal, was actually somewhat lofty because he felt that if he could prove that Ashkenazi Jews were not Semites, that he could end anti-Semitism. <laughs> and so his goal was to prove that Ashkenazi Jews were in fact descended from these folks in, um, uh, you know, in the uh, in the Khazarian Empire. The counter argument is that only the Kagans or only the kings of that empire converted to Judaism, but that the people, in fact, themselves did not. So, I suppose that was that was okay at the time. That was during the 70s. There was no genetic record that could be used. And so he had a theory, and you know, and it was kind of new and romantic, and, and it was about the Jews, which means that all the newspapers were going to pick it up and write something about it, whether they knew anything about this or not, and generally not critical, but complimentary, uh, is the way most of those articles came out. Um, but that kind of talk and thinking, unsubstantiated in the eyes of other people, can become something rather ugly. I give you, for example, um, this guy Tex Marr, who lives in my home state of Texas. He's an Austin, Texas-based con um, conspiracy theorist and, and pretty well-known anti-Semite. He picked up a comment by an Israeli who has some issue with Ashkenazim because he's half Sephardic and half uh, Mizrahi. And he made, Iran El Hayak, made the statement there are no blood or family connections among Jews. The various groups of Jews in the world today do not share a common genetic origin. Their genome is largely Khazar. Whatever Israelite blood the Khazars, Khazar Jews have is minuscule. That concept has become a polemic, both for the ultra, ultra left as well as for the Arabs in an attempt to discredit the first and second Aliyah back to Israel in the late 1890s. And that whole concept produces things like this. And this is why I'm here today. There's got to be a reason that APAC has asked me to come and speak now three, four, five years. And it's because I'm standing here telling you it's not BDS. It's BDDS. The goal is boycott, divest, delegitimatize, and sanction. The only country I ever hear anyone question its right to exist is Israel. No one says that about Papua New Guinea or France or Somalia. But Israel, almost a special case. And when you have scientists or, or thinkers who are saying that, that the first and second Aliyah were bankrupt by people who, and led by people who were really Eastern Europeans and not Middle Easterners, uh, it all tends to knock that, that, 
that uh, idea that we were, that our ancestors who went to Israel when it was still Palestine were returnees, which has been our claim. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce to you Professor Shlomo Sand. Uh, Professor Sand was born in a displaced persons camp in 1946. His parents were communists, yet they decided to move to, uh, to Israel when it became a country in 48 or 49. Uh, he has his MA in French history. He has his PhD in Marxism. Um, uh, he's a professor, uh, maybe, I think still a current professor um, of art history at Tel Aviv University. He wrote the books, The Invention of the Land of Israel and the Invention of the Jewish People. And when asked, why did you come back to Israel? He said, amazing statement. He said the coffee scene in Dizengoff in Tel Aviv was so great that it was irreplaceable and he had to come back to Israel. He has renounced his Judaism. He, will, he proudly says it on his Wikipedia page. But when I went to his Wikipedia page, a few years ago, and actually in 2009, I found the most amazing quote that for the last 10 years I have not been able to get it out of my mind. What he said was, there is no racial or ethnic basis for being Jewish any more than there is for being Christian or Muslim. And the great majority of those who consider themselves Jewish today are descended from converts in Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and North Africa, not from ancient Hebrews mythically expelled from the Holy Land by the Romans, and hence are in no sense ethnic Semites of Near Eastern origin or ethnic anything else. And he's talking about 90% of you in this room. This is the way he looks at you, and this is the way he looks at me. Collectively, this is the way he looks at us. So, I just happen to sit uh, as the president of a genetic genealogy company on a treasure trove of data. And I took advantage of that fact. I started, I, I started to go through our database. It took me weeks to go through our database, identify all the male lineages that were Jewish. If I had two men with the same last name, I would throw one of them out because I was only looking for, in effect, one name for each representative uh, lineage. And then I summed them up and kind of characterized what the DNA of, of the Jewish people looked at. And ultimately, I did the same thing for Sephardic Jews, and then I reached out to a uh, colleague, Dr. Hammer, at the University of Arizona, and I said, give me your Muslim populations. I want to look at all the Middle Eastern populations, and I want to do the same thing so I can make a basis for comparison. So let me go to the next slide, and let's kind of eat this elephant in pieces. Sand said, there is no racial or ethnic basis for being Jewish any more than there is for being Christian or Muslim. Sand seems to reject the idea of any historical connection uh, between Jews from different countries and different backgrounds. His argument claims that Jews who are Sephardi and Jews who are Ashkenazi share nothing but a false belief that there must be a genetic link between these historically separated groups. In my mind, that would extend to groups around the world who claim to have been Jewish in their past. So let's look at a few real world examples. Number one, I show you Berta Sanchez. Berta was born in Spain uh, to a Catholic family. Amazingly, after 500 years, they had an oral tradition of being Sephardic Jews. 20 generations. She wasn't able to prove this using 
conventional genealogy paper trails. In other words, she wasn't able to go back from her mother to her grandmother to her great-grandmother to an incident in 1492 that said, and the Jew converted. And so she had no evidence. She had no proof. So she turned to DNA testing in an attempt to, uh, to solve her problem. And once she did, uh, I will tell you, and I'll show you the slide in a moment, we received, she received no matches whatsoever from anyone Jewish who had tested with our company at that time. All of those folks would have been Ashkenazi. She had no matches. She also had no matches to anyone in our database who was not Jewish, who was from Europe. And so I reached out to another colleague, Dr. Daron Behar uh, from, uh, from Rambam uh, in Haifa, and I said, uh, can you share your DNA results with me? I have a profile I'd like to look at. So he sent me about 2,000 samples of Sephardic Jews from all the countries whose land masses touch the Mediterranean, and the same thing with their non-Jewish populations. And when we got the results back, Berta, who didn't match anyone in my standard D DNA database, matched two people from Algeria, one person from, uh, let's see, one person from Bulgaria, and at that time, five people from Turkey, none of whom lived in Bulgaria, Algeria, or Turkey. They all lived in Israel because they all had moved as Jews to Israel after the founding of the state. Now, since that time, we have found some additional uh, samples, uh, and you can see them here. Uh, we have one match that was found to, uh, to Berta's DNA found in Cuba, uh, one found in Germany, two found in Spain, a couple more found in Italy, another one found in Morocco, all places that we know Sephardic Jews went when they quit Spain in 1492. And then four samples now that she matches in Spain, representing families, I believe, like Berta's, who chose to stay in Spain, converted to Catholicism, probably expecting that the Spanish government would come to their senses like most other governments did when they exiled the Jews and said, for a tax, you can come back into the country, but it never happened in this case. And so, Berta's family had this oral tradition, but none of the other non-Jews uh, here have that oral tradition. It's been lost in time as they have been dispersed around the world. But you can run, and you can try to hide, but not if you take a DNA test. A DNA test can reveal amazing facts once we start scratching the surface. Now, has anyone here been to or heard of the island called Mallorca? Okay. Has anyone heard of a population called the Chowetas? No? So, Chowetta means rib, and in 1450s, the Chowettans were forcibly converted on the island of Mallorca to Catholicism, although they stayed in their little ghetto, they lived together, they stayed like that, and they retained their businesses, which means that now these Catholics, rather than these Jews, were silversmiths and goldsmiths, uh, you know, living, living in Mallorca. However, uh, the situation for the Mallorcans was such that they married within because the old Christian community wouldn't marry with this new Christian community, so they were still stigmatized. To prove how Catholic they were, these Chowettas, Chowetta means rib, they used to stand in the doorposts of their house and gnaw on pork ribs to show their neighbors that they were just as Catholic as they were. So I've written to this fellow, uh, Javier Caldes, from Mallorca, and he says, unfortunately, since the Inquisition, it was too dangerous to be a Jew in Mallorca, and no one would talk about the subject. The conversion was so enforced, and for so many years, that the Chowettas, let me pull up that slide for you, that the Chowettas um, had to show that they were very religious in the Catholic, in the Christian faith, 
even though they were not accepted in society until this day. So all I've learned from Judaism is what I've studied on my own. I see all this heritage as a responsibility to do something to go back to my roots. I'm not married yet, and really it would be great to have a Jewish wife. In that way, Judaism would be important again in my family, and my kids would be Jewish. All back to the way it was. And then I wrote him a year later, I had asked him how much genealogy work you've done. He said, yes, I even had my family tree done to the 1500s. And all of my ancestors on my mother's side have combinations of the 15 Chouetan surnames. As you know, there was a lot of endogamy, which means marriage within, as they did not marry with other people with non-Jewish backgrounds. My grandmother, a Chouetta on both sides, mother and father, was the first to marry a non-Chouetan since the forced conversions of the 1500s. If you see the matches in her empty DNA, it looks like a shul directory, <laughs> as does mine. And so here's the interesting thing. When we look at his DNA, his DNA, I'm circling it there, it's from a group called ROA2M. Now, that is a scientific term uh, or a scientific classification which tells us which branch of the female tree of mankind this comes from. This comes from RO, ROA. ROA is Levantine. It's Middle Eastern. It's not found in Spain, typically. You find H and HB found in Spain. This is something that you find in the Middle East. And every one of these matches that Javier has are Jews, except they're not Spanish Jews, probably because I don't have enough Spanish Jews in my database, which means these are Ashkenazi Jews. In fact, the, the next to the last one is a relative of mine. And so we have a descendant of forced converts living in Majorca whose female DNA matches Ashkenazi Jews, which means that the likely the best, uh, like Occam's razor, the most uh, simple solution is generally the correct solution, would say that this DNA was in the Middle East and it dispersed, thank you, it dispersed both to the Levant, from the Levant to Spain, and it also, uh, it also ended up in Eastern Europe via a different route. And when you look at the countries that these folks have come from, you can see all of his matches are Eastern European. Now, I know I just got a message a little while ago which probably tells me that 40 of our, of our 70 minutes are up, so I'm going to move on here and stop telling jokes and just get to the heart of the matter here. So the second thing that Dr. Sand or Professor Sand said was the great majority of those who consider themselves Jews are descendants from converts in Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and North Africa. Well now, to answer this question, what we need to do is we need to talk about who the Jews are on a genetic level. And can molecular biology now answer that previously unprovable argument? Now if you remember, I had shown you this tree earlier. And on the tree, I've now labeled the branches of the tree that we find Jewish men in. So we find Jewish men in a branch called E, which is North African, G, which is from the Caucasus, or is primarily found in the Caucasus, I, which is found in Southeastern Europe, we should remember that due to Professor Sands' statement, J is typically found in the Middle East, Q is found in Central Asia, he referenced that as well, R is found in Turkey and Kurdistan, and another branch of it is dominant in Europe, in particular Western and Northwestern Europe. And then we have a branch called T, and it's from Lebanon. So I decided to use the Sephardim as the truth set, because no one's saying that the Sephardic Jews had a mass conversion event that would have diluted their theoretical Semitic DNA into something else. And so this is what Sephardic Jews look like. 
We have an amazing 48% of Sephardic Jews are in that J branch, which is from the Middle East. We have about 13%, which is from uh, E, which is North Africa, and about 16% are from the Caucasus. 18% uh, are in this R group, which is spread out not only in Western Europe, but also in Syria, Turkey, and, and uh, parts of the Western uh, Fertile Crescent. And then you have some bit players. You've got uh, the T group, which is found in Lebanon, only found in Jews at about 3%. That I group from Southeastern Europe is found in 1 in 100 Spanish Jews. And then the, uh, that Q group from Central Asia is found in 2% uh, of Sephardic Jews. If Kostler's right, if El Hayak is right, you're going to see the Ashkenazi slide as substantially different than the Sephardic slide. But if they're, you know, if they're similar, then it means that those guys might have their theory wrong. So let me show you what the Ashkenazi sample looks like. Let me show you what the Ashkenazi sample looks like. So again, Sephardic, Ashkenazi. Okay? Sephardic, Ashkenazi. Are there differences? Yes. The, four, the, the I was 1% among Sephardim, it's 4% among Ashkenazi Jews. The, uh, the Q group from Central Asia was 2%, and here it's 5%. And statistically, that's over double, which means that, that it matters. However, remember the words, the vast majority of those who consider themselves Jews are from I, Eastern Europe, Q, Central uh, Asia, or E, North Africa. Now the E, the North African group, was pretty high in both Sephardic and Ashkenazi. But the real cinch here would be to look at what our cousins look like. Let's look at our Muslim cousins. And our Muslim cousins look like that. So I could say to you, what's the difference? Maybe it would be nice if I just put them all up together. <laughs> now, who's the odd man out? I don't see an odd man out here. Maybe the odd man out is the Ukraine. <laughs> if you look here, J is only found in 8% rather than in the 40s. I, which is found between 1 and 4%, between Sephardim, and Ashkenazim, and it's also found, by the way, 3% in the Muslim populations of the Middle East. Here it's 36%. It's very, very clear to me, and to any molecular uh, or pop gen that I've talked to about this, that Ashkenazim are as Semitic as Sephardim, as our Middle Eastern, as our Muslim cousins. Which is why, which is why I say, that almost all Jews are my third to fifth or seventh cousins. Yeah. Muslims are just hundredth cousins. I mean, hundredth, really, hundred generations ago. But, but we're still a lot closer to them, both religiously and genetically, than we are to, you know, the Christians of Europe. Despite what people will say when they talk about in Judean Christian culture, etc. Etc. So let's keep moving. So who are we on a genetic level? Or who are we really? There are Muslim Arabs. There are Christian Arabs. And I'm submitting to you today that there are also Jewish Arabs. Because we Jews, as you've seen, whether it's Sephardic or Ashkenazi, our Y chromosomes come from Arabia. We just got into a fight with the superpower of the time over our religious freedom and we lost and we paid the ultimate price. We lost our country. We were dispersed from our country over this. And when I talk to Muslim Arabs 
and I try to explain this to them, I tell them that they today would do and are doing the same exact thing that we did to defend our religious freedom when our temple was being defiled by the Romans 2,000 years ago. So let's have a little fun. Is it now time to ask the ultimate political question? <laughs> Is it time for Israel to make an application to join, uh, uh, to join the Arab League? And I just want you to know that just in case, Bennett Greenspan is prepared. <laughs> now, my contention is that you'll always be able to tell the Jewish Arabs from the non-Jewish Arabs because undoubtedly we'll be the ones wearing the Tommy Bahama shirts. <laughs> uh, Sands also said, not from ancient Hebrews, mythically expelled from the Holy Land by the Romans, and hence are in no sense Semites of Near Eastern origin or ethnic anything else. I think we've pretty much answered that. But finally, I think we have something that can be, uh, we have some historical uh, record that we can use, unless you happen to think that the Arch of Titus was made in an antique shop. The inscription by the people and the Senate of Rome says, this inscription records the dedication of this arch by the Senate and the people of Rome to the emperor after his victory over Judea in 70 AD. I, I have to tell you, I have no idea what Sands' statement means. I, I, I really don't. I've thought about it. You know, does he have an agenda? What's his agenda? I mean, this is just, the, the Arch of Titus has been there. Who's been to Rome and seen the Arch of Titus? I mean, okay. You know, you've seen this. It wasn't manufactured in an antique shop. This has been sitting there for 2,000 years. So, what, what can we say? Uh, when people have an agenda, facts don't matter. Remember that. That is so, so, so important for us to remember. And this is not a commercial advertisement in any way, shape, or form, but all it takes is a swap. What we do is we scrape the inside of people's mouths to do any one of those three tests, and then you or whoever can compare their DNA and see where it fits in in the mosaic or the cornucopia of DNA of mankind or the mosaic of, of, of Jewish DNA. And it's really easy to do. You just scrape the inside of your mouth, you take a swab, you put it into a little test tube with some salty water in it that stops all bacterial growth. Uh, and we once had a fellow who came to us and said, um, I'm a cartoonist and I, I draw in exchange for things and I really want your thing. So uh, tell me your best story. And I said, oh, that's easy. That was the doctor who scraped and he didn't get any results twice. And so we got him on the phone to try to understand what he was doing. And he said, well, I followed your instructions. I scraped the outside of my cheek. <laughs> we said, no, 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 doctor. You're supposed to scrape the inside of your cheek. And he said, very embarrassed, am I supposed to scrape the outside of the inside of my cheek or the inside of the outside of my cheek? And the cartoonist said, I don't need to hear any more. I know the slide. <laughs> that I'm going to make up for you. And indeed, you can see he has his family tree DNA. Kent, he's on the phone, he's saying, Doctor, I'm having a little difficulty with my cheek swab. And you can see where he has his scraper, and indeed, he's scraping in very much the wrong place. Because we, as a laboratory, do not do what's called day two testing which looks at the microbiome because we just think we can keep it a whole lot cleaner by uh, by doing the, the bubble scrapes. And then I have, I think, one, maybe one more slide for you. It's, what's so neat about this is that this was done in 1997. And the fellow, uh, you can see it says that the woman is saying to her husband, you don't look anything like the long-haired skinny kid I married 25 years ago. I need a DNA test to make sure it's still you. And so I have one more slide for you, and then we'll open this up to some friendly Q&A. Um, 
I don't support what this guy's doing in the next slide, but you know, I do this for a living. So seeing the ubiquity of DNA testing is, is kind of a good thing for me. It's a picture of a, of a guy in Sarasota, Florida, um, or at least my customer sent it to me from Sarasota, Florida. And, uh, and it's a fellow, he's, he's holding one of those cardboard signs, you know, that people at, the, at corners write down, you know, some message in an attempt to get you to give them, you know, quarters or a dollar or something like that. So it's a picture of the man who says, need money for DNA test, girlfriend might be sister. <laughs> and, I, and I really thought that was probably the most creative hand handling uh, event that I've ever seen. I, I don't know how he did with this, with this, but I sure know my audiences love it. And so with that, let me move it over to here. Uh, we'll take questions and answers. If you have email questions, I mean, questions for me, I'm happy to take them. I've uh, bravely put my email address here in the company's website, my name again. And so if you have questions, uh, it's typical that a month after one of these events, I get an email that says, I heard your lecture and I was terribly confused. Can you help me? Or something along those lines, sometimes even complimentary. Um, so, ma'am? Hi, um, thank you so much. Thank you, folks.